In our last video, we asked the question, what is your mortgage number? Essentially, what is the maximum you can borrow at the best bank for you in your current financial situation? Today, we're going to look at what you can do when your mortgage number is not enough to get the house that you want. But first, if you get even a smidgen of value from these videos, click the like button and hit subscribe to see our future videos. We usually release a new video every Wednesday teaching you how to get the most out of your mortgage. Everyone who is paying rent can borrow something. You're already making regular payments to a landlord, so some part of your income is going to living costs. The problem is that banks test what you can afford at a much higher servicing rate. At the time of recording, around 7.3%. And for most people, their current rent, when put towards a mortgage of 7.3%, doesn't add up to much. The rest of your purchase has to be made up from your savings, or in other words, is made up of what you don't spend from your income in any given month. Based on that, here are five tips for increasing your mortgage number, or five tips on how to get the bank to lend you more. If you think we've missed something, drop us a comment and tell us how you managed to increase your mortgage number. Our first tip is that dreaded word, budget. To find out where you can save money, you need to know where your money is going. Tools like pocketsmith.com import your recent bank statements and categorize where your expenses go. You can shuffle these categories around or correct them if needed, but are a good way to find out exactly where the holes in your savings bucket are. Most people vastly underestimate how much they spend on non-discretionary items, items like coffees, takeaways, etc., over a month. To see our review on Pocketsmith, just Google Mortgage Lab Pocketsmith Review. Our second tip is to look at your budget and decide which of your expenses is really too high. Could your grocery bill be reduced by buying an equivalent budget brand? Many of the more expensive brands have a budget equivalent and in blind taste test, it's often hard to tell the difference. Buying in bulk is good for some things. You have plenty of stock that you can use over time. For those who survived the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, you'll know what I mean. But have a think about how much you're throwing away each week in perishables, things like fruit and vegetables, and consider whether you are buying too much of these for your household. It's not a good idea to cut out fruit and vegetables, no budget should ever be at the cost of your health, it's just about buying the right amount that an absolute minimum of it is wasted. How many nights per week do you buy takeaways? Could you make that just one night per week? Could you swap expensive takeaways for cheaper ones like fish and chips for example? I would do, bro, but I don't eat chips. No, I only eat plankton. Our third tip is to review those credit cards and buy now, pay later debts. You, you may pay off your credit card every month and never even purchase more than $500 on them, but if your limit is high, then the bank has to assume you're going to spend up to that limit. Banks typically assume you need to pay between 3 and 5% of that limit per month, meaning a $10,000 credit card limit reduces your income by up to $500 per month, even if you never spend a cent on that card. That $500 per month reduces your mortgage borrowing capability by around $70,000. So a credit card that you never use could be reducing your ability to borrow by around 7 times its limit. The best action for this, especially if you don't ever use the card, is to cut up the credit card and cancel them. When you do, get a note from the bank to confirm they've been cancelled. To read our article on this, Google how much does a credit card affect your lending. Buy now, pay later debts are treated roughly the same. If you are paying $250 per fortnight or $500 per month, the bank needs to assume you are going to continue with those payments, even if you have no intention of using the facility ever again. From their point of view, you have shown that you are someone who uses these facilities, so they have to assume you'll continue to do so in the future. The best thing you can do is to pay off and stop using all those buy now pay later facilities at least three months before applying for a mortgage. Eve. Eve. 
Even what financial advisors would class as good debt is affecting your ability to borrow. Borrowing money on a student loan is of course a good thing. In the long run it can, although not always, lead to higher income. But most income earners will be paying their student loan out of their salary. At the time of recording, 12% of your salary once you earn over $21,268 per annum. If you can repay your student loan without affecting the deposit that you have for your home, it might be worth considering doing this and freeing that money up in your income to put towards your mortgage. This is most common for those people that only have a few thousand dollars left on their student loan. They can pay the last few thousand dollars, show the bank that the money is no longer going from their salary and receive a huge boost to their affordability. Again, don't spend so much money on paying off your student loan that you've got no deposit left if in doubt, talk to your mortgage broker before paying anything. You could always get a pre-approval from the bank conditional upon you paying off your student loan to check everything is going to work first. Our final tip is to consider other lenders and appreciate that different lenders have different lending amounts. Even across the main banks, the amounts each bank will lend you will vary by around eighty to ninety thousand dollars, and sometimes, under certain policies, up to a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Second tier lenders may cost you half a percent to 07 percent more in interest, but may allow you to borrow slightly more. This option isn't for everyone, but imagine being able to borrow hundred thousand dollars more at a second tier lender. If your property goes up by ten percent in the next three years. It's an additional $10,000 of capital growth that you wouldn't have had. The cost of it might be an additional $5,000, which is a win, even before considering that you could have more enjoyment from a slightly larger house. As I say, it's not for everyone, but is worth considering. That's it for now. The five tips to increase your mortgage number were know where your money is going, cut out what you can from your budget, get rid of that secondary debt, see if you can pay off your student loan if you have one, and consider other lending options. If you think of any others, let us know in the comments. I'm Rupert Goff, thank you for watching. Tell me something I don't know.